Thank you, and good evening. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in the debate tonight, and I consider it a real privilege to be discussing these issues with so eminent a scholar as Dr. Ludemann. Despite our obvious differences, there are a number of important issues on which we do agree, and these deserve to be highlighted at the outset. First of all, we agree, in Dr. Ludemann's words, that the resurrection of Jesus is the central point of the Christian religion. Second, we agree that if someone asks, what really happened? It is not enough to be told to just believe. Third, we agree that the historian's task is very much like that of the trial lawyer, to examine the witnesses in order to reconstruct the most probable course of events. Fourth, we agree that if someone does not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus, he should have the honesty to say that Jesus just rotted away and that he should not be persecuted for having had the courage to say it. And fifth, we agree that if someone does believe in Jesus' resurrection, then he should admit that he believes in a miraculous intervention of God in the natural world. Despite these areas of agreement, however, we obviously have wide-ranging differences, too. So in order to focus our discussion tonight, I propose to defend the two following basic contentions in tonight's debate. Number one, any adequate historical hypothesis concerning the resurrection must explain four established facts. Jesus' burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And number two, the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now let's look at that first contention together. I want to share four facts which are widely accepted by New Testament scholars today. Fact number one. After his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb. This fact is highly significant because it means that the location of Jesus' tomb was known. In that case, the disciples could not have preached the resurrection in Jerusalem if the tomb had not been empty. New Testament researchers have established this first fact on the basis of the following evidence. Number one. Jesus' burial is attested in the very old information handed on by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. Two, the burial is part of very old source material used by Mark in writing his gospel. Three, as a member of the Jewish court that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. Four, the burial story itself lacks any traces of legendary development. And five, no other competing burial story exists. For these and other reasons, the majority of New Testament critics concur that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb. According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Fact number two. On the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Among the reasons which have led most scholars to this conclusion are the following. One, the empty tomb story is also part of that very old source material used by Mark. Two, the old information transmitted by Paul in 1 Corinthians implies the fact of the empty tomb. Three, the story itself is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. Four, the fact that women's testimony was worthless in first century Palestine counts in favor of the women's role in discovering the empty tomb. And five, the earliest Jewish allegation that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body 
itself shows that the body was, in fact, missing from the tomb. I could go on, but I think that enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the resurrection, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Fact number three. On multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars for the following reasons. One, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances, which is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians, guarantees that such appearances occurred. These included appearances to Peter, the 12 disciples, the 500 brethren, and James. And two, the appearance traditions in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of these appearances. Dr. Ludemann himself concludes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four. The original disciples believed that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every reason not to. Think of the situation that the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Two, according to Jewish law, Jesus' execution as a criminal showed him out to be a heretic, a man literally under the curse of God. And three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples believed in and were willing to go to their deaths for the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Dr. Ludemann himself agrees that historical analysis leads to the abrupt origination of the Easter faith of the disciples. So in summary, there are four facts which are agreed upon by the majority of New Testament scholars who have written on these subjects, which any adequate historical hypothesis must account for. Jesus' burial by Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. Now we start to disagree. For although Dr. Ludemann acknowledges the appearances and the origin of the disciples' belief, he disputes the burial and the empty tomb. With respect to the burial, he admits that it would be going too far to deny that Joseph of Arimathea is historical. But, he says, we can no longer know where Joseph, or Jews unknown to us, put the body. With respect to the empty tomb, Dr. Ludemann dismisses it as a legend. Now, I'll leave it up to Dr. Ludemann to refute the evidence I listed, which has led most scholars to affirm the historicity of Jesus' honorable burial and empty tomb. What I'd like to do now is to examine why he denies these two facts. Since I have the privilege of going first tonight, I'll have to first briefly explain Dr. Ludemann's views before offering my critique. Concerning the burial, his main reason for denying Joseph's laying Jesus in the tomb is that the later Gospels tend to exalt Joseph, calling him a good and just man, or even a disciple. But even if the later Gospel writers have this tendency, that doesn't seem to be a very good reason for denying the fact of Joseph's putting Jesus in the tomb. That Joseph did give Jesus an honorable burial is already implied by the fact that Joseph singled out Jesus to be buried and apparently had no concern for the two thieves crucified with Jesus. 
Thus, the tendency of later gospel writers to exaggerate Joseph's devotion to Jesus has not led most scholars to deny the fundamental reliability of the burial story. Wolfgang Trilling, a German New Testament scholar, concludes that it is unfounded to doubt the fact of Jesus' honorable burial, even historically considered. What about the empty tomb? Here, Dr. Ludemann's skepticism is based upon three assumptions which seem very dubious. Number one, he assumes that the only primary source we have for the empty tomb is Mark's gospel. But surely this is mistaken. Matthew and John also have independent sources for the empty tomb. It's also mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles and it's implied by Paul. To quote the biblical critic Klaus Berger, the reports about the empty tomb are related by all four Gospels and other writings of early Christianity in a form independent of one another. We have a great abundance of reports which have been separately handed down." End quote. Number two, Dr. Rudemann assumes that when Jesus was arrested, the disciples fled back to Galilee, a hypothesis which the historian Hans von Kappenhausen rightly dismisses as a scholarly fiction. Not only is there no evidence for this assumption, but it's inherently implausible. I mean, can you imagine the disciples fleeing from the Garden of Gethsemane, grabbing their things, and not stopping until they get all the way back to Galilee? Moreover, Dr. Ludemann's own theory contradicts this assumption, because it's crucial for his theory that at least Peter remained in Jerusalem, where he denied Jesus. Finally, number three, Dr. Ludemann assumes that the Jewish authorities suffered a sort of collective amnesia about what they did with the body of Jesus. Even if Joseph, or Jews, uh, unknown to us, only gave Jesus an, a dishonorable burial. Why didn't they point to his burial place as the easiest answer to the disciples' proclamation of the resurrection? Dr. Ludemann admits Jews showed an interest in where Jesus' corpse had been put, and of course a proclamation of Jesus as the risen one provoked questions about his body from opponents or unbelievers. So. Why, when the disciples began to preach the resurrection, didn't the Jewish authorities say where they had put Jesus' body? Dr. Ludemann's answer? They forgot. Again, this would, I think, appear to many as less than convincing. So it seems to me that we not only have good positive reasons for accepting Jesus' honorable burial and empty tomb, but that Dr. Ludemann's reasons for denying these facts aren't very persuasive. So, I think we have good historical grounds for affirming these four central facts, Jesus' burial, the empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. The question is, how do you best explain these four facts? Well, that leads me to my second basic contention. The best explanation for these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, historian C.B. McCullough lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation of uh, given historical facts. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all these tests. Number one, it has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty, why the disciples saw appearances of Jesus, why the Christian faith came into being. Two, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone, why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive despite his earlier public execution, and so forth. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims, the resurrection serves as divine confirmation of those radical claims. Four, 
It is not ad hoc or contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, that God exists. And even that need not be an additional hypothesis if you already believe in the existence of God, as Dr. Ludemann and I do. Five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, does not in any way conflict with the widely accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. The Christian agrees as wholeheartedly with that belief as he agrees with the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And finally, number six, it far outstrips any of its rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. Down through history, various rival explanations of the facts have been proposed. For example, the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, the hallucination theory, and so forth. Such hypotheses have been almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. No naturalistic hypothesis has attracted a great number of thinkers. But if that is the case, then why, we may ask, does Dr. Ludemann reject the resurrection hypothesis? Well, as you read his book, the answer becomes clear. The resurrection is a miracle. And Professor Ludemann just cannot bring himself to believe in miracles. He states, historical criticism does not reckon with an intervention of God in history. Thus, the resurrection cannot be historical. It goes out the window before you even sit down at the table to look at the evidence. So what justification does Dr. Ludemann offer for this crucial presupposition that miracles do not happen? Well, all I could find was a couple of one-sentence allusions to Hume and Kant. He says, Hume demonstrated that a miracle is defined in such a way that no testimony is sufficient to establish it. The miraculous conception of the resurrection, he says, presupposes a philosophical realism that has been untenable since Kant. But Dr. Ludemann's procedure is all too hasty here. Thomas Morris, a philosopher, comments in his book, Philosophy in the Christian Faith, what is particularly interesting about the references theologians make to Kant or Hume is that most often we find the philosopher merely mentioned, but we rarely, if ever, see an account of precisely which arguments of his are supposed to have accomplished the alleged demolition. In fact, says Morris, I must confess to never having seen in the writings of any contemporary theologian the exposition of a single argument from either Hume or Kant, or any other historical figure for that matter, which comes anywhere near to demolishing historical Christian doctrine or theological realism. Hume's argument against miracles was already refuted in the 18th century by Paley, Less, and Campbell, and most contemporary philosophers also rejected as fallacious, including such prominent philosophers as Richard Swinburne and John Earman and analytic philosophers such as George McBrodies and William Alston. Even the atheist philosopher Anthony Flew, himself a Hume scholar, admits that Hume's argument is defective as it stands. As for philosophical realism, this is the dominant view among philosophers today, at least in the analytic tradition. So if Dr. Ludemann wants to reject the historicity of miracles on the basis of Hume and Kant, then he needs to explain himself further. Otherwise, his rejection of the resurrection hypothesis is based on a groundless presupposition. Reject that presupposition, and it's pretty hard to deny that the resurrection of Jesus is the best explanation of the facts. Now, of course, Dr. Ludemann offers an alternative explanation, the hallucination hypothesis. After he explains it, I hope to show that it does not, in fact, meet those six tests for being the best explanation. But for now, we may note 
that if Dr. Ludemann's only reason for preferring it to the resurrection hypothesis is that the resurrection is a miracle, then this amounts to nothing more than a philosophical prejudice against miracles. I had uh, prepared a speech that would last 20 minutes, but after what I've heard, I think I have can forget that speech and would like directly to respond to my critic. I would ask him if Jesus was raised as the Gospels tell us, where did he go afterwards? As all of us know, he went to heaven. As the act of the apostles, the author of the gospel who tells us. But I would like to ask my opponent, does he really think that he went to heaven? That is to say that what we are dealing here in New Testament text are images of the people of a specific time that cannot be equated with facts. And if you take one of the things out of the sequence, resurrection, ascent to heaven, and then even heavenly return, the whole thing will collapse. Again, I would ask my opponent who stresses the biological resurrection of Jesus, what did Jesus do afterwards? Did he rise to heaven? And in addition, I would ask the question, how does he think about all the other things that we are being told about Jesus? that he was born by a virgin. So the whole question is a little bit more difficult than just to reduce it to, uh, to facts. The first thing I would like to say is we are dealing here with ancient texts of a specific time, ancient texts that were not written by eyewitnesses. None of the four evangelists were eyewitnesses. The only eyewitness witness we know is Paul, and that eyewitness didn't know Jesus. That is the problem that we are dealing with here. So in other words, the first job to do, which is being taught in every introductory course that I teach, is to look at each individual, individual source and to determine the relationship that they have to one another if they were no eyewitnesses. And here it is the assured result of 250 years historical research that the Gospel of Mark is the oldest one and that both Matthew and Luke were using Mark and in addition a document called Q. So in other words, what Klaus Berger said about my book in connection with the empty tomb story that there are four independent accounts. He has long since withdrawn after public discussion where I reminded him of that. He only wrote that in order to throw dirt upon me, the public uh, newspaper. And with that I come to a second point. All the debates concerning the resurrection have to do with emotions. For some reason or another, which I can explain, even the most respected scholars that I know are becoming cold feet if they talk about the resurrection, if they have to deal with the question that Jesus' body rotted away. It has probably to do with all of our, our, our wish to be immortal, to avoid death if possible, to dream of another world, of a paradise, to overcome death. And I think that wish is not only limited to us, it has also to be recognized among the early Christians when we talk about the source of their visions of Christ. So in other words, we are dealing here with the problem, with the job of historical understanding of early Christianity, which up to 1700 nobody was really dealing with. Before that time, the theologians were interpreting scripture allegorically. All of them thought of the people as being eyewitnesses, and, for example, the virgin birth was explained as such that 
Mary remained a virgin and that the cervix remained closed when Jesus was born, a thing which some Catholic theologians uh, teach today as it is in the Catholic Catechism. And the similar things are being said about uh, the resurrection. Then people were thinking as to whether uh, if Jesus had eaten after the resurrection, whether he had to go to restroom. These are uh, questions which you must understand, uh, questions uh, and procedures proposed by people who believe in what is being said in the Bible. And I'm the last to deny that the Bible really says that Jesus was eating fish and bread. But if the Bible says so, that doesn't mean that we have to believe it or to defend it. There then our job begins. And if you cannot understand that, and I assume that many of you have never heard anything about historical criticism, uh, if that's too rough for you for the time being, let me uh, make a detour and let me speak about the negative statements in the Bible about the Jews. When you look at the Passion narratives, all the four New Testament Gospels elevate Pilate and say he is a very good guy, and who killed Jesus, who was responsible for the death of Jesus? The bad Jews. And this anti-Jewish attitude has permeated Christian theology since the first century and had disastrous consequences for the Jewish people. Nobody in the world would today assume that that's true what the New Testament writers say about the Jews. That is, if that's not true what they said about the Jews, all of it which they have written has to be examined because we want to know what really happened. That's our job to do. So in other words, I'm taking a quite different approach than my uh, opponent. And uh, uh, if I may at least use one paragraph of my original lecture, uh, I wanted to start my lecture here with the following quotation of a famous theologian. He writes, as a young student, I heard a series of lectures given by a celebrated liberal Old Testament theologian on Old Testament introduction. And there one day learned that the so-called fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, had not been written by Moses, although throughout it, it claims to have been spoken and indeed been written by Moses himself. Rather, I heard Deuteronomy had only been composed seven centuries later for a quite specific purpose, that is roughly 700 years after it is supposed to have been written, a long time. Since I came from an Orthodox Lutheran family, I was deeply moved by what I heard, in particular because it convinced me. So the same day I sought out my teacher during his office hours and in connection with the origin of the Deuteronomy, let's slip the remark, so is the fifth book of Moses, what might be called a forgery. His answer was, for God's sake, it may well be, but you can't say anything like that. I wanted to use that quotation in order to show that the results of historical scholarship can have difficulty in being uh, made known to the public, especially to, to believers. Because every Christian, or many Christian, many Christians here threatened if he or she learns that most of what's written in the Bible in historical terms is untrue. That none of the four New Testament Gospels were written by the authors which are written on the top of your text. So in other words, I'm dealing or try to deal with the Bible in historical terms, strictly historical terms, and there I see a difference to my uh, opponent. Let me make that explicit when I uh, talk to you about the empty tomb. The empty tomb is being uh, 
excuse me, when I talk about the burial of Jesus, I come to the empty tomb afterwards. The burial of Jesus is mentioned in the four Gospels and in Paul and in Acts 13. Before you ask the question, was he really buried, you first test the quality of the sources, as you would do test the quality of the witnesses in a court of law. Here then, you proceed chronologically. You examine the earliest source, and that is Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, and about that I would like to say more afterwards. As far as the Gospels are concerned, there are differences concerning the burial which cannot be overlooked. In the Martin account, Joseph is not a Christian. In the other accounts, he is a Christian, or he is only has been Christian tactically. So in other words, the person to bury Jesus is aimed at more in a more positive way, the younger the source comes. So that, in other words, we can establish a trajectory, a development of the tendency how Joseph of Arimathea is being described. Now looking back to, to Mark, we see that already in Mark, although he's not a Christian, he's called as somebody who is waiting for the kingdom of God to come. So here the question arises, is it not possible, is it not likely that this statement already is a positive tendency made by Christians in order to uh, characterize the person who buried Jesus in a more positive way. So that's the first step that we try to establish the development of the tradition before we then ask the historical question. And here now we have to say that there's another tradition in Acts 13 that the Jews who were hostile to Jesus buried Jesus. We have two traditions. One, Joseph of Arimathea is burying him. On the other hand, the Jews were burying him. And it is not impossible that that may belong to one of the same source. But still, the historical question has to wait. Now I come to the question of the empty tomb. And I would, I just would like you to, to give you some examples of how we, how we proceed. The oldest source for the tomb or for the burial of Jesus is Paul, and the, and the decisive question is, which Dr. Craig and I disagree upon, is whether Paul knew the empty tomb. Dr. Craig said Paul presupposes the empty tomb, and uh, I disagree for the following reasons. Let me first read to you the text. Paul is reminding the Corinthians what he has transmitted to them during the foundation of the community, and he said, I himself was instructed in that. And then he goes on to quote what he has transmitted to them, and the quote runs as thus. Runs thus. Christ died for our sins according to scriptures and was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures and appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So no mentioning of the empty tomb is in this text. I repeat it again. Christ died for our sins according to scriptures and was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures and appeared to Cephas. Listening to the text, it will strike you that twice according to the scriptures is, is in the text. That is to say, <coughs> probably there were two lines in the text that Paul was quoting, and each line received the qualification according to scriptures. Jesus' death for us according to scriptures, and Jesus' resurrection on the third day according to scriptures. And each line is then gets a further qualification, the burial and the appearance. So in other words, the burial is added or is, uh, belongs to the death in order to show that he really died. So the burial reinforces the death, and the appearance of Jesus reinforces the resurrection. That's the logic of this oldest text that we have, and I would say 
here, the burial has nothing to do with the resurrection, if you study the text, because the burial reinforces, confirms the death, whereas the appearance of Cephas reinforces the resurrection. Okay. So the logic is, see, he appeared to Cephas, hence he was raised. See, he was buried, hence he was dead. That's the logic. And it's not possible, at least it's difficult to read the empty tomb into this text, all the more so since Paul is dealing here with opponents or friends in Corinth who denied the resurrection. If he had known about the empty tomb, he would certainly have referred to that fact in order to, to have an additional argument for the resurrection. Now, one could, of course, say, well, a Jew at that time would immediately think of bodily resurrection, and therefore the tomb must have been empty. But it's not so easy. There are various notions of resurrections around. One of them was that it was bodily. But Paul himself distinguishes in First Corinthians two notions of body. The one body, flesh and blood, that cannot inherit the kingdom of God, that will perish, and the other body, which is changed, which every Christian will get. So he himself, First Corinthians himself, is a witness to the fact, he yeah, used the word fact, uh, that Paul obviously did not know anything about the empty tomb and that he didn't need it for his own concept of resurrection. Now what is, uh, that's the way how uh, we proceed here in, uh, in scholarship. And now, uh, let me uh, ask the question, what's then the origin of the resurrection, the belief in the re of resurrection? The hostile Jews said, well, the origin is a simple deceit. The disciples stole the body and claimed that he rose. Well, I wouldn't say that a deceit lies at the heart of most religions, not even at the Christian religion. At the heart of the Christian religion lies a vision, described in Greek by Paul as Ophir. He was seen. And Paul himself, who claims to have had an appearance of Jesus, says repeatedly, I have seen the Lord. So he, Paul himself, he's the main source for the thesis that the origin of the belief in the resurrection is a vision. That vision, which also occurs with respect to, to Mary. There are many people who have seen Mary. She's appearing again and again. I have now a book out on Mary which will come out in English in March. I've studied the Mary visions. I think here we have similar phenomena. Though her body decayed, she was seen again and again. And now some Catholic theologians even discuss the question whether the body really decayed. That's an open question. So I think when we talk about visions, we know something that all of us have, have every other night when we dream. That's our subconscious way of dealing with reality. And a vision of that sort, I think, was at the heart of the Christian religion, and that vision, connected with enthusiasm, was contagious and led to many, many more visions, until uh, we have a vision before more than 500. So much for my own uh, approach to the resurrection. I think we have uh, to answer, uh, uh, if we can say where Jesus went after he was on earth, if we have to ensure that he went to heaven, we have to look for the most clear hypothesis to explain all the texts. Anybody who says uh, where he really rose from the dead biologically is faced with another problem, with another question that I would address at the end. Please note, I say that at the end, that's not my main argument. If you say that Jesus rose from the dead biologically, you would have to presuppose that a decaying, that a decaying corpse, which is already cold, without blood in your brain, could be made alive again. I think that is nonsense. Okay, okay, thank you.
Well, I too am going to have to flex on the comments that I was going to offer because Dr. Ludemann really didn't explain his alternative hallucination hypothesis in any great detail, so it's difficult to criticize a theory that hasn't been explained. So let me first look at what he did say in response to my positive case, and then I will add some comments about uh, why I think his theory does not pass those six criteria for being the best explanation. First, let's clear up a general misunderstanding evident in his first speech. He said the Gospels are not written by eyewitnesses, and therefore he is taking a different approach than his opponent. He is taking a strictly historical approach. I want to emphasize as strongly as I can that nothing I have said this evening presupposes that the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses. I am not assuming any different approach than the approach of critical scholarship which Dr. Ludemann himself is using. We are on the same playing field using the same criteria and the same methods. What I'm arguing is that the majority of New Testament scholars today, not conservatives, uh, not fundamentalists, the majority of scholars today concur with the facts of Jesus' honorable burial, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. And that the best explanation for those four facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, is that in fact the case? Well, let's look first at the burial. I gave five reasons as to why most scholars accept the honorable burial by Joseph. Dr. Ludemann chose to respond to one of these, that there are no competing burial traditions. He says, ah, yes, in the book of Acts, it said that the Jews buried Jesus. Not at all. That uh, expression in Acts chapter 13 about the Jews burying Jesus is simply part of that general pattern that he himself explained of blaming the Jews for what happened to Jesus. In fact, in the book of Acts, it actually says that the Jews crucified Jesus before uh, he was buried. So that this in no way implies a different tradition than that of Joseph of Arimathea, who was, after all, a Jewish authority burying Jesus. So I think we've got all five reasons intact in favor of the burial by Joseph. Now what about his counter-argument that the later Gospels elevate Joseph? He says, this raises a suspicion that perhaps in Mark already there's a positive portrayal of Joseph. But what he's got to show is that there's some reason to doubt that that is uh, the case, that Joseph, in fact, did bury Jesus in the tomb. I don't see any reason to doubt it, and he hasn't given one. In fact, I suggested that Joseph singling out Jesus alone to be buried shows that he already did have a special concern for Jesus, and he just let the, the two thieves be disposed of probably by the Roman authorities. So most scholars today agree that the burial story is fundamentally accurate in its historical core. Now what about the empty tomb? I listed five reasons why most scholars believe that the tomb of Jesus was found empty by women. He disputes one of those reasons that Paul mentions or implies the empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15. Here he says Paul doesn't mention the empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15, and this suggests that it's not historical. But he misquoted Paul in what he said to you. What Paul actually says is, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he uh, was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. The words and that are usually left out in English translation because they're grammatically unnecessary, but they're in the Greek. And what they do is to order each of those events serially as having equal importance and equal weight. In other words, the burial is not just thrown in to sort of underline the reality of the death of Jesus. Rather, we have listed here the principal sequential events in Jesus' passion and resurrection. The death, the burial, the resurrection, which corresponds to the empty tomb narrative, and then the appearances. So Paul, I think, certainly does imply the empty tomb. E. E. Ellis, who is a New Testament uh, expert on Luke says, to the earliest Palestinian Christians, a resurrection without an empty grave would have been about as meaningful as a square circle. So in saying that Jesus was buried and he was raised, Paul naturally meant that an empty tomb was left behind in its wake. Uh, none of the other evidence for the empty tomb was disputed by Dr. Ludemann. I then examined his three assumptions on which he denies the empty tomb, and I questioned all three of those. 
He sought to establish again only one of them, namely that Mark is our only primary source for the empty tomb story. But here his assumption was that I was just saying, well, we've got four Gospels, therefore we have four sources. And that's, of course, not my point. My point is that Matthew and John use independent sources for their empty tomb story than Mark, as is evident from the differences between Matthew's empty tomb story and Mark's. Also, don't forget that the book of Acts refers to the empty tomb, and so that provides independent attestation. So it's not true that Mark is the only primary source for the empty tomb. Uh, in short, Dr. Ludemann's reasons for denying the empty tomb are based on assumptions which I think are very dubious. So I think these central facts have been established, that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea, his tomb was discovered empty by women, Dr. Ludemann agrees with the postmortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. So the question we face is, what is the best explanation of these facts? Well, what Dr. Ludemann says in his book is that the best explanation is hallucinations. Peter had a guilt complex for having denied Christ three times, so he hallucinated Jesus. Uh, and this led to a chain reaction among all the other disciples who also hallucinated, and they mistakenly came to believe in the resurrection. Paul, he says, also had a guilt complex because he struggled under the Jewish law and its demands, and so he hallucinated Jesus on the Damascus Road. Now, is that really the best explanation? Well, let me look at it by means of those six criteria. First of all, explanatory scope. I think this is the real Achilles heel of the hallucination hypothesis. It tries to explain the appearances, but it says absolutely nothing about the empty tomb. And thus, its explanatory scope is too narrow, and it cannot be the best explanation. Number two, what about explanatory power? doesn't even explain the appearances. Well, let's uh, grant for the sake of argument that Peter had a hallucination of Jesus after his death. The question is, does that have the power to explain the resurrection appearances and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection? Well, I don't think so, for two reasons. First of all, the diversity of the appearances can't be well explained by the hallucination hypothesis. You see, Jesus didn't appear just one time, but many times. Not just to one individual, but to different persons. Not just to individuals, but to groups of people. Not just at one locale and circumstance, but at various. Not just to believers, but to unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. And the hallucination hypothesis simply can't be stretched to accommodate that kind of diversity. In particular, it has great difficulty explaining the appearance to James, Jesus' younger brother, who didn't even believe in Jesus during his lifetime. The appearance to the 500 brethren, most of whom were still alive when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15 and could be questioned about the experience. The appearance to the women, which occurred prior to Peter's experience and so can't be explained away as a result of Peter's hallucination. So hallucinations can't account for this kind of diversity. Secondly, hallucinations fail to explain why the disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. You see, as projections of the mind, hallucinations can't contain anything that's not already in the mind. So if the disciples were to project hallucinations of Jesus, they would have projected him in paradise, where the righteous dead went until they awaited the resurrection at the end of the world. But at the most, that would have led them to proclaim that God had glorified Jesus in heaven, or the assumption of Jesus into heaven, but not his physical resurrection from the dead. Thus, the hallucination theory has weak explanatory power, both in it can't account for the diversity of the appearances, and it uh, cannot account for the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. Number three, what about plausibility? Let me give two reasons why I think Dr. Ludemann's hypothesis has little plausibility. First, there's little plausibility in his psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul. Let me give two supporting reasons. First, there's simply insufficient data to do this kind of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is notoriously difficult, even with a patient seated in front of you on the couch. But it is virtually impossible with historical figures. And that's why psychobiography is rejected by historians. Martin Hengel, who is a great New Testament scholar, writes, Ludemann does not recognize these limits on the historian. 
he gets into the realm of psychological explanations for which no verification is really possible. The sources are far too limited for such psychologizing analyses. Secondly, though, the evidence that we do have indicates that Paul did not struggle with some sort of a guilt complex under the Jewish law. Nearly 40 years ago, the Swedish scholar Christer Stendahl pointed out that Western readers have the tendency to interpret Paul in light of Martin Luther's struggles with guilt and sin. But he says, Paul, the Pharisee, experienced no such struggles. Stendhal writes, contrast Paul, a very happy and successful Jew, one who can say, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless, Philippians 3.6. That is what he says. He experiences no troubles, no problems, no qualms of conscience. He is the star pupil, the student to get the $1,000 graduate scholarship in Gamaliel Seminary. Nowhere in Paul's writings is there any indication that psychologically Paul had some problem of conscience. And thus Dr. Ludemann's uh, hypothesis simply has little plausibility in its psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul. A second respect in which it has little plausibility is the idea that the appearances were merely visionary experiences. He admits that reducing the appearances to hallucinations depends on the presupposition that what Paul experienced on the Damascus Road was the same as what all the other disciples experienced. But there's no reason for that presupposition. John Dominic Crossan, who is the co-chairman of the Jesus Seminar, explains, Paul needs to equate his own experience with that of the preceding apostles. To equate, that is, its validity and legitimacy, but not necessarily its mode or manner. Paul's own entranced revelation should not be presumed to be the model for all the others. But once that presupposition is gone, then there's simply no reason to reduce all of the appearances to these visionary experiences. So his theory has little plausibility, both in its psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul and in its attempted reduction of the appearances to mere visions. I wish I had time to go on to show how it contradicts accepted beliefs, is contrived, and fails to outstrip its rival theories, but I'm out of time. Perhaps we can get to those points later on in the debate. One answer was not given. One answer was not given. Whether Jesus really ascended to heaven. That's uh, part of the whole image or concept. Getting out of the grave being restored to a healthy body and then ascending to heaven because he had to go somewhere. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to receiving that answer. I think that on the question of the burial, we are in basic agreement. I wouldn't call it an honorable burial, but it's Jesus was obviously buried, and here we uh, a different, have a different opinion from John Dominic Crossan, who said that Jesus was eaten by the dogs. Um, in that case, saying that Jesus was eaten by the dogs means to replace tradition of a burial by imagination. So there is a tradition of the burial in Paul, a very old tradition, and it's likely to be historical. At the same time, I have to uh, defend myself for not quoting the Greek text correctly, and uh, I have to get my Greek uh, right. So let me read a literal translation uh, to you what I uh, was trying to say. I transmitted to you verse 1 Corinthians 15, 3, among the first things what I myself received, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. And after that the construction changes, Therefore, we can assume that what I just quoted to you goes back to a very old tradition. <laughs> 
the observation that led me to the hypothesis that we are here to that we have a two line creedal formula was that the second part of every line has according to scriptures, which is very uh, astonishing. And then I looked at the content and uh, uh, described what the form said about the burial for the first line in order to reinforce the death. And the appearance I connected with what is being said about the resurrection. So I would uh, defend myself here and, and would say, well, look at the text. That's the text. And that's also universally acknowledged that the statement about the burial is related to the death. It uh, states he's really dead. And the appearance says he really was raised. The question of whether uh, Jesus really died was a disputed one among early Christians. Some Christians thought that he didn't really die, and we connect that statement then with a uh, docetic uh, view. That tradition we have, I, let me repeat it again. Jesus died for sins according to scriptures and was buried. He was raised on third day according to scriptures and appeared. And even if the fundamentalist Earl Ellis says, well, a Jew would automatically uh, say, well, nothing in the tomb, that there's nothing about uh, what's true in this case. I repeat what I said. Paul is not using the idea of the empty tomb in the argument for the Corinthians, which he would have done if that had been so important for him. Because in Corinth, he had Christians who disputed the resurrection of the dead. Second, when Dr. Craig says hallucination, um, he insinuates a negative or connotation. Whoever says there's a hallucination at the end, at the beginning uh, passes a negative judgment. I don't mean it in a negative way. I'm always talking about vision, and I think a vision is a primary religious experience that led to the whole movement. It may be that in some footnotes I'm using hallucination, but my most uh, the expression that I most like is a vision. And a vision is something of uh, a power inside of human beings, which uh, in many cases uh, is leading to completely reversal and change of one's life. I know that using psychoanalytical uh, models from the 20th century and applying them to the first century is uh, difficult. Uh, but I do know also that many biblical scholars, like Martin Hengel, who has been quoted, are glad that we don't know anything about the dynamics inside of Paul. He even says so. It's good for us not to know what was going on in the CK of Paul. And that's what I am critical of. Some biblical scholars just are interested in not knowing what was going on in, 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 in inside with the early Christians. And again, we have here to explain, in the case of Paul, how a persecutor all of a sudden changed his lifestyle and became a Christian. Saying that that's an intervention of, of God says nothing. It doesn't help to understand what was going on. That's the Deus ex machina who is all of a sudden just tells everything. That helps nothing. No scientist, no historian, outside of some theological circles, is uh, using the idea that God is intervening. And the historians who have done so have used a bad political theology. When they thought, well, uh, with the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, God intervened and has punished the Jews. And there are other ideas in uh, historiography, secular historiography, where this idea of God's plan was used. I just remind you, which you know, that nobody outside of some theological quarters is toying with the idea that God is acting or God is doing something in history. In scholarship, we have to look for the causes for something. We have to use the most sober explanation 
to account that accounts for a certain development, and that I have tried in the case of Paul and the case of early Christianity. And I'm aware that that may be questionable. Number three, I get the impression that Dr. Craig is looking at the resurrection stories um, as one block, one piece of evidence. He's mixing Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John, and even Paul. I would suggest a different procedure. I would say, suggest that we have to start with a Pauline witness, the Pauline witness which presupposes an appearance from heaven, a visionary experience, so as to speak, a visionary experience, and that that visionary experience in the early tradition was later replaced by the stories which you, for example, read in Luke, where all of a sudden Jesus shows up and eats fish. And uh, 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 I have an explanation why Luke is telling such a story. My explanation is that there are other conflicting theories and opinions of Christians who claim that Jesus did not eat, that the resurrection was not a bodily resurrection, but a more spiritual resurrection, and for that attitude, there's now ample evidence in the Gnostic sources, where those who defend uh, physical resurrection are just condemned. So in other words, according to uh, my approach, to my result, these stories in Luke, John, look at Thomas, for example, who's invited to put his hand into uh, the nails of Jesus, these stories reflect a secondary stage of the resurrection tradition which is supposed to meet and to defend and to answer certain other theories for which we have instances in the Gnostic sources. Uh, I'm very glad to hear that according to Dr. Craig, none of the evangelists was an eyewitness, but isn't that natural that people living, let's say around 80, 50 years after what happened to Jesus, by using their own imagination, their own interest, uh, by creating these stories and we're, we're answering certain charges, conflicting theories that were spreading around their communities. That's the way historical scholarship has to deal with the text. Not as eyewitness reports, but as documents that are coming from the interest, stemming from the interests of certain people who transmitted them. And that then leads to a very revised picture of the early uh, Christian preaching of the development. Again, source criticism and tradition criticism is everything here. You have to start with Paul and see that the gospel stories are secondary development. And therefore then, and with that I would uh, conclude, Luke has to get rid of Jesus from this earth. He had to get him back to heaven again and have him 40 days eat and talk to the disciples. That's the consequence of the Lucan approach, the early Christian approach according to Paul. Paul didn't know of Jesus spending 40 days with his disciples. And one last word, of course, Jesus appeared again and again throughout the ages, until today. Many, many people saw Jesus throughout the ages, had experiences of Jesus. But the church had to put a stop to these experiences, see, and had to put a stop. And this, uh, in other words, uh, uh, when we talk about resurrection witnesses and as to who is an apostle and so forth, these are decisions of the Jerusalem church who had to, to define its own authority and these are the other conflicting uh, uh, stories. And therefore, our Apostle Paul, who according to Luke is not an Apostle, very important, he appears to him in the act of the Apostle, Paul is not getting the apostolic uh, appearance. Yes. Therefore, the Apostle Paul had, historically speaking, so many difficulties in being acknowledged as an Apostle in Jerusalem. An historical approach leads to very different results that Dr. Craig has presented to you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Let's review those four facts which I said are agreed upon by the majority of critical scholars today and that underlie the fact of Jesus' resurrection. First, the burial uh, of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Dr. Ludemann in his last speech says, yes, it is likely that uh, Jesus was buried uh, and that he's willing at least to largely to concede this point. But then the question arises, which I pressed in my first speech, if that is the case, then why didn't the Jewish authorities simply point to the burial place of Jesus as the easiest answer to the disciples' proclamation of Jesus' resurrection? Uh, he has to assume they suffered a sort of collective amnesia about what they had done with the body of Jesus. And that just seems to me to be extraordinarily implausible. Secondly, I gave several lines of evidence for the empty tomb, five lines of evidence, in fact, only one of these has been disputed, and that is Paul's implying it in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, in this information Paul hands on, he uses the phrase, according to the scriptures, to qualify Jesus' death and his resurrection. But notice that all that proves is parallelism of the first and the third lines of the saying. It does not prove subordination of the second line to the first and the fourth line to the third. And that's what he has to prove if he's to deny that Paul is referring to the historical event of Jesus' burial in that passage. When you compare that tradition in 1 Corinthians 15 to the sermons in the book of Acts, the uh, tradition in 1 Corinthians 15 is like an outline of the early apostolic preaching. And it refers in sequence to the death, the burial, the empty tomb or resurrection, and then the appearances of Jesus. So I think Paul is clearly implying there that an empty grave was left behind. But Dr. Ludemann says, look, Paul believed in a spiritual uh, body, uh, and he doesn't use the empty tomb there as an argument. Well, I think Dr. Ludemann misunderstands Paul's purpose in 1 Corinthians 15. He's not trying to convince the Corinthians that the resurrection of Jesus was physical. That's what the empty tomb would prove. And that's precisely what the Corinthians objected to. So Paul doesn't want to use the empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15. What he wants to show the Corinthians is that the resurrection is in some sense spiritual, and therefore they shouldn't gag at it in the way that they have apparently done. But notice that for Paul, the spiritual body is a transformation of the body that is in the tomb. He says it is buried an earthly body. It is raised a spiritual body. It is it is put in the ground or uh, interred as a dishonorable body. It is raised as a glorious body. There is historical continuity between the body that is interred and the transformed spiritual resurrection body that uh, inhabits the uh, life to come. So actually, far from denying the empty tomb, that actually implies the empty tomb, this transformation of the earthly corpse of Jesus into a spiritual, supernatural body fit for uh, inhabiting the world to come. And as far as I can see, none of my other lines of evidence for the empty tomb were disputed by Dr. Ludemann. He agrees with the post-mortem appearances of Jesus and the origin of the first disciples' belief in the resurrection. So the only question is, what is the best explanation of these facts? Now, I contend that a supernatural explanation is the best explanation because it has better explanatory scope, explanatory power, it is plausible, it's not contrived, it's in accord with accepted beliefs, and it outstrips its rival theories. But Dr. Ludemann says, well, look, did Jesus ascend into heaven then? Is that what you believe? Well, I believe that Jesus, yes, left this four-dimensional space-time universe. And that's a perfectly uh, comprehensible and coherent notion, scientifically speaking. Uh, Jesus' body uh, ceased to exist in this four-dimensional space-time manifold that is described by the equations of general relativity and special relativity and all the rest. Jesus exited this for space-time uh, dimension. I don't see any difficulty with that. Uh, he says, well, uh, God's intervention doesn't really explain anything. Well, I certainly think it does. Now, I admit that as a methodological procedure, you ought to seek first natural explanations. But if no natural explanation is available, and if there is a supernatural explanation suggested in the religio-historical context in which the event occurs, then I see no reason why you should be barred 
from inferring a supernatural explanation. The arguments of Kant and Hume that he referred to, as I say, have long been refuted and rejected as false. At the very most, all that science shows is that it is implausible or improbable that anyone should rise naturally from the dead. And I agree with that. Of course, that, that would be absurd to say that all the cells in Jesus' body spontaneously came back to life and he, he rose naturally from the dead. But there is no improbability in the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that is definitely explanatory if no naturalistic hypothesis is forthcoming. Well, has he given a good naturalistic alternative then, the hallucination theory? Well, I don't think so. We saw it has weak explanatory scope. It can't explain the empty tomb. It has weak explanatory power because it can't explain the diversity of the appearances, especially the ones to James, the 500 brethren, and the women. It has also weak explanatory power in that it can't explain why the disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection rather than just his assumption into heaven or his glorification. I said that it is implausible because uh, there is inadequate data to do a psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul, and, and he doesn't deny the point. I said it's also implausible because it depends on the presupposition that all of the disciples' experiences were these heavenly visions. He says, but Paul's letters were the earliest records we have, and Paul's experience was visionary. Well, I agree that Paul's was a visionary experience. But the point is that we have multiply attested traditions in the Gospels that the disciples had different kinds of experiences. And Dr. Ludemann himself says that his whole analysis is based on the presupposition that you can take what occurred to Paul and impose that on the Gospel narratives so as to make them say that they had the same kind of experience Paul did. And that is simply an unwarranted presupposition. There is no good grounds for thinking that you can shove the gospel appearance narratives into that kind of procrustean bed. So in short, I, I don't think that Dr. Ludemann's hallucination hypothesis passes the criteria for being the best explanation of the facts. By contrast, the resurrection hypothesis does and therefore, it seems to me that it's perfectly rational as a modern 20th century person to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. If you approach the text the way Dr. Craig approaches the text, you have, of course, to deal with the many analogies of ascension to heaven that we have from antiquity. In that case, then, you would be, have to be more generous as far as various claims of religions of antiquity go and grant them that the heroes really went to heaven, were raised, and so forth. And that is out of the question, at least in the historical method. Again, I would like to repeat to, to say, well, that's a that supernatural event it explains nothing. But that uh, does not relieve me of uh, having to offer another explanation. But we are meeting a very many difficulties. We have many ascension stories of heroes to heaven, the same way as Jesus ascended to heaven. What should we do about them? One solution, of course, could be, well, the one is uh, described in the Bible, and the Bible is the word of God, and hence, therefore, it's true. But we would have them to talk about the authority of the Bible. The other um, more specific objection I would like to raise is um, Dr. Craig's statement that we are not allowed, or I'm not allowed, to read the experiences of the disciples through Paul. Well, I think that's the only way we can do it for the following reasons. First of all, all the appearance stories that we have in the Gospels are not eyewitness accounts. So they have gone through more than one hand. We don't get to the basics. They have been shaped by Matthew, Mark, and John to serve their theology. And we do not even know whether the authors, the evangelists talk about, had told them themselves. So we are there on very shaky ground. Therefore, we have to turn to somebody who was an eyewitness, who claimed to have been an eyewitness, and here Dr. Craig grants me that Paul had a vision experience. 
of the St. Paul and now the text is a very important. And by the way, texts are very important this question. The St. Paul claims in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11 that at least of all Christ appears to him. And he's using here the same verb, ofte, he was seen by me, that he was using for the other apostles. So in other words, he claims to have had the same experience that the others had received before. Isn't that now uh, important or necessary just to, to grant for that? that he was right in that point and that he had the same appearance that the others had also. And to conclude from that statement that the others had visionary experiences too. That would be my question. Now you can of course say, well, Paul is not sharing the truth. We have to check that. But in that case then, we would uh, lose a very important witness. Then we would have only tertiary reports about the appearance of Jesus so his disciples and these appearances stories were shaped by the interests of the second or third generation that had emphasized the bodily, fleshly resurrection of Jesus. Okay. So I think my procedure here to start from Paul is sound. If Paul is right, if he had a similar appearance that the others had, then we have a right to read the appearance of the others through the window of the Pauline experience. Let me say two more things. First, if Joseph of Arimathea had buried the body, would, not have, would it not have been possible or the best attack on Christianity just to ask him, let them show them where the body was in the first couple of days? Would not the full tomb of Joseph of Arimathea be the strongest argument against Christianity? Well, we don't know when the Christians became a very important movement. According to the Acts of the Apostles, they started to preach only 50 days after the death of Jesus. After 50 days, you wouldn't see much left. So we, so we don't know here enough about the other days, about the early days. And second, let me repeat again that the whole idea of Jesus' son being raised from the dead getting out of the tomb, staying with his disciples, 40 days, and then coming back to heaven is a concept that is valid in itself. If you take one brick out of it, everything collapses. And let me add something, an element which belongs, which has to be added to that context. The other element that is still missing is his glorious return from heaven, which according to Paul, and I'm stressing Paul here, but Paul is our only, only eyewitness, would happen within the lifetime of the first generation. But that return from heaven didn't come, didn't happen. And I think the fact that it didn't happen for 2,000 years is a very strong argument against that. And I would say, well, he will not come back. Let's better be certain about that. In other words, resurrection, ascension to heaven, belief in its immediate return, a mythical element of the faith of the early Christians in the first century, which we cannot take uh, as simple descriptions of facts, but which are far, which are part of their uh, mythical worldview. And our attempt now is whether, in the light of these findings, if they are true, whether in the light of these findings we could define, redefine what is Christian again, or whether, with the non-return of Jesus from heaven, Christianity would collapse. That is the question that I would uh, pose uh, to you. And that then would lead us away from the uh, question for, for facts, I mean, and uh, uh, lead away from the factual question to the hermeneutical question whether we can be still Christians today, which is, I think, uh, not unimportant, which we should ask at the end. I don't need one minute, I think I've said everything. <laughs>